coming today to the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. This is one of our Blue Bag seminars. It's a lunchtime seminar that will be held periodically as uh, topics come up that we think are of interest to the public and to staff as well. So today's topic is about smart driveways. Um, and it's something that is appropriate for residential areas as well as, I guess, commercial treatments, but we'll find out more from our speaker, Stacy Anderson. But first, a few words about the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. We are a special unit of local government um, that is based on the receiving water body, which consists of 15 miles of the Mississippi River, from Fridley down to the Ford Dam at 46th Avenue in Minneapolis. The water that drains from approximately 45 square miles into the section of the river defines our boundaries. We have seven mem member communities, so parts of the city of Fridley, Hilltop, Columbia Heights, St. Anthony Village, Lauderdale, about half of Minneapolis, and a little bit of the city of St. Paul all flow into this section of the river. We also have a member community, which is the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board, which is our seventh member, uh, because they own land in this area, and that affects the water that comes into the Mississippi River. Um, if you notice, the boundaries are very angular, they're very geometric, and that's because we live in a densely populated urban area, and this reflects the pipe system that lies underneath the ground. And so our boundaries, since they're based on how the water flows, it's both above the ground as well as underneath the ground in the pipe system. So if you are wondering why the boundaries of our watershed come so close to the chain of lakes, it's because the water that goes down the storm drains in this part of the watershed drains all the way back to our stretch of the Mississippi River. We do a lot of different things, including capital projects and programs such as uh, water monitoring, uh, education and outreach, and we have a stewardship fund grant program. And that might be of interest to some of you who are here today, especially people with uh, the thought of doing a residential application. If you work with your neighborhood group, this might be one of the best management practices that you can um, install on your property. And we do have a deadline coming up June 3rd uh, for our mini grant uh, program. I think with that, I will introduce Freya Rowland from uh, the Water Resources Monitoring Team who will introduce our speaker today. So we are very pleased to have Stacy with us today, and I'm just going to give a short little bio about Stacy. Um, Stacy Anderson is the owner of Earth Wizards, a paving and landscape company with a vision to balance urban development with water conservation. She grew up working in a family paving business where her father had the motto of paving the world. Despite her father working for her now, she's inspired him to help her unpave the world, or at least do it a little differently. Since 2005, Earth Wizards has been designing and installing what Stacy terms as smart driveways and landscapes. And today's presentation will inspire you with visuals and examples of projects that you can consider in your own home. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stacy. Thank you, Freya, for the nice intro. And thank you, Jenny. Thanks for uh, the Mississippi Water Management Organization for giving me the opportunity to talk about one of my passions in life. And you might not think it's something to get passionate about, but I guess when you've been doing it your whole life, you know, it's just good to be passionate about what you do. And for me, it is driving. So I was at um, uh, a talk that uh, for churches looking to do some BMPs or best management practices on their properties. And churches oftentimes have these large parking lots, you know, that are only used two or three hours out of an entire week. So we were talking about some of the options, but at the beginning, people went around and said, okay, you know, spring is coming. What reminds you of spring? And of course, I had these people talk about, you know, the smell of oil or the smell of certain plants and, and uh, you know, the blooms coming out, the magnolias, and it's the birds. And it came to me, and I had to admit, this is a bit of an embarrassing fact, but when the work crews are out patching the roadways, that smell of blacktop, to me, is when I go, spring is here, and it gets me excited. Could also be because, you know, that's how we make our living. So, um, the purpose of this discussion is to really talk about driveways, and whether we like it or not, we've got them. And um, it's just thinking about, you know, maybe doing it a little bit differently. So as Freya mentioned, I grew up in the blacktop business and uh, I built my shoulders and my back working on the crew and I think I will always be a linebacker. I won't be able to get rid of, you know, my, 
my upper body. <laughs> I'll never have that svelte look. But um, it's, you know, it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've enjoyed it. And I went and uh, at Coe College, I got a degree in chemistry. And oddly enough, I don't like chemicals. But there was a stint that I did a summer program up at a field station outside of Ely. And I looked at, and this will age me a little bit, and some of you might understand, but back then it was acid rain that we talked about. So back in the 80s, our concern was acid rain, and I looked at three different lake systems, and we'll see, because it's been about 25 years if I get this right. So Freya, we've got a ligotrophic, eutrophic, and mesotrophic? Yes. All right. So it was interesting to look at, after a rain event, what would happen to the pH of the water system, and which lake systems did better, kind of buffering that impact. So I thought I had somehow revolutionized the world and I was gonna figure out the answer to acid rain. And when I went to my advisor, he just completely, I don't know, told me I was absolutely silly. And I think that's when I decided no longer was I gonna continue towards my master's or PhD because evidently I wasn't smart enough. So I went back into the paving business. But it was interesting because after I decided to start my own small company here in town, the family business had gotten bigger. I, I just wanted to be here. And um, I got involved with a group called the Minnesota Erosion Control Association. And through them, I started to understand uh, about stormwater and stormwater quality. And of course, that we were contributing to that. And I had this consternation of, OK, I should stop doing this, you know, I'm contributing to the problem. And um, then I gave it some more thought and I paused and I thought, well, we still need driveways, we still need roadways until we can figure out some sort of alternative transportation with our economy, but this is how it is. So I decided, okay, we can just do things differently. So that's the purpose of, of this talk and that's kind of how it's evolved into this type of a company. So, as you know, there's three essential basic driveway um, surfaces that, that we look at. So the first one being asphalt, and there's a lot of different types of asphalt driveways in terms of mixed designs, and I won't bore you with that, but um, there's some, there are some options with making it sturdier to last longer, uh, to do some surface uh, alterations to it to make it try to look like pavers or other things. But asphalt is the most economical way to go. And to me, in the state of Minnesota, it's the smartest way to go, but that's kind of my, uh, that's my opinion on it. Uh, we certainly have concrete, as you know, it's generally white, but tints, colors, different types of patterns can be inlaid into concrete to provide a lot of different looks. And then pavers, there's uh, just a wealth of different pavers out there now. There's your clay pavers, and then there's your concrete pavers and then all, as well as stone pavers, which you don't see too often. So now we're gonna segue immediately into, okay, but how can we do it differently so we're not doing that, right? And the purpose of it is, you know, sometimes I think we forget about the fact that we're upstream and uh, there's others that live downstream that are living with the problems that we're creating. And so this is what we really need to think about and the fact that we are contributing to the problem. So, how do we do that differently? And driveways are one of the areas on your property that you can identify and say, okay, here's an opportunity. Essentially, the driveway is like a downspout. I mean, it's a place where water is being concentrated that you can say, I'm gonna do something with it. So um, there's essentially three categories that we're gonna talk about here with doing driveways a little bit differently. And the first one is gonna be about capture. And so when I talk about capture, I'm talking about getting that, that storm water that's coming off of somewhere and bringing it down through the surface into underneath, into a, what we term a storage bed. So um, permeable systems, it's most important how they're designed underneath. And there's a lot of other particulars that I won't quite get into at this point. But really, if you think about any surface type, any surface can be made to be permeable. The actual material itself may not be permeable. So one of those being permeable stone or permeable pavers. The, so the actual stone or the pavers themselves are not designed to be permeable, but it's the joints. It's how you construct the system overall so that the joints and what's underneath is what is moving that water into that system. And 
one of the things that people, I think, kind of forget about is um, you still have a slope to that surface that's still really important for kind of overflow. So you still have a slope and people go, well, the only water that gets to that area, but that's not true because you kind of slope it so that the water will hit if it, if it's not getting into that first joint, it's getting into the second joint, it's getting into the third joint, it's getting into the fourth. So it, it actually does work. Um, turf stone pavers is another uh, one of the tools or surfaces that can be used and they're either filled with a uniform graded aggregate or with um, compost and or topsoil and a seed blend. Now the other systems, uh, we have porous asphalt and pervious concrete and I know I'm throwing out three different terms, right? There's permeable, there's porous, there's pervious. Essentially it all means the same. Uh, we attach certain terms to the certain different um, products just because that's kind of how we talk about it. When it's permeable, we're referring to the fact that the actual surface isn't permeable, it's the joints in between. When we're talking about porous asphalt or pervious concrete, now that surface is constructed to allow the water to go through that material itself. So the trick to that, how it's done differently, is that the fines are no longer in that material. When you have asphalt or concrete, generally it's a three-quarter inch aggregate and everything's smaller. So with these designs, with a porous system, they've taken out the fines entirely. Now the trick for them is to figure out how to get it all to bind together. So that's where it gets a little more expensive, it gets trickier, there's um, issues that kind of result with raveling and things of that sort. But their um, different polymers, fibers, and different binders are included to keep that material intact. But that, with that type of surface, the water's moving right through it, which is really cool to see. And then we have the grid systems. So those are recycled uh, plastic usually. Sometimes there's rubber added to it. And those grid systems um, are, again, either filled with a granite or seeded. So we'll get into, uh, I just wanted to show you some kind of uh, really good photos. I like to provide a lot of visuals. So we'll go through this kind of fast. and. I'm hoping with a lot of visuals that gets you kind of excited and gets kind of ideas going through your head. So permeable are, sorry, the permeable stone, any different stone again can be designed so that water goes through that system. Now this is a nice formal kind of an elegant stone. You can also do like an irregular, this is a Chilton flank stone. And here's an example of permeable pavers. And again, the pavers, there's a lot of different options in terms of sizes, um, colors, shapes, all of that. And with this particular photo, it was really neat. We, um, for a few years, we used to host a, a tour to go around to some of our sites. And engineers, city officials uh, would be on this bus, and it was kind of fun. The one time we had a party bus, which was a little weird, we all faced each other, but we got to know each other pretty darn well. So as we're pulling up to this project, this is at Ingebrigtsen's over on Lake Street, it started to rain, and it was a deluge. We must have gotten like two inches in 20 minutes. It was intense. So as we're pulling up, and it's pouring down rain, and everybody was good sports, so we all go out there and we're standing in this small area as it's pouring. And it was so amazing to watch and everybody was just in absolute awe. So you see this deluge occurring and you could see that overall again we had the surface so that it was so that it was graded out. We have a building which you can't see on the right side and a building on the left side. So we had to be really careful with what was going on here that there wasn't too much ponding with, with an intense volume coming off of that rain event. So it was sheet flowing off of the surface, but there was still infiltration going on at the same time. And then as the rain let up a little bit, you could really see that it was taking it this quickly and it was just impressive. Within five minutes, the rain had stopped. We're explaining the project. Five minutes later, this is a rain garden that hadn't been planted yet that you see. So the water comes into the permeable pavers and then would fill into the rain garden. Within five minutes, what you saw as ponding water was gone. So it was kind of neat because, you know, we are earth wizards and they, they thought for sure we must have staged this. So it was, it was a lot of fun. So this is another example of permeable pavers. This is kind of the precursor of all of them. This is a uni eco stone. It's a European, well, that's where it all started was in Europe. And I, 
And a lot of people talk about, you know, permeable pavements don't work here. We're not in the right climate for this, which is a bunch of bogus. I mean, these pavements have been designed in similar climates in Europe and in Canada for the past 30 years. So we're a little slow about coming around to it. And it's, when you start seeing these surfaces in the wintertime, I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing. You're not getting that kind of ice sheet that you'll get on regular pavements. The sun comes out and it's gone. So with the permeable pavements, they keep, because there's airflow, in the summertime it stays cooler, in the wintertime it stays warmer. And again, when you've got that subsurface of a uniform graded aggregate, that's where that water is going to. So there's no water um, in those freeze thaw that generally is creating that expansion contraction movement. So, but you have to look at a bunch of other factors, which we won't get in. So here's the turf stone with the grass in there. And um, on the other side is actually the recycled grid structure that has the granite in there. And this is the guys putting down the porous asphalt. And this was actually a lot of fun. It was done in November, which is not a good time to be doing this. But um, we were doing a project for the city of Albert Lee and uh, doing a bunch of different permeable pavement types down there. And the guys were all worked up that this, this stuff is not good to work with. This is going to be awful. It's not going to work. It's uh, too difficult to manage. And I said, you know, instead of telling me all of this before you're, you've ever worked with it, why don't we put it down and then you guys can tell me everything. So the truck came and within 15 minutes we had laid 15 tons of porous asphalt. And it went so smoothly and we were done in no time and it looked gorgeous. We got a couple of five gallon pails of water, dumped it on the surface and the guys were just amazed. And they said, why don't we do this all the time? So this is a close-up of the porous asphalt. Again, you can kind of see it's a grainier look than what you would typically see with the pavement. Same with the previous concrete. And the previous concrete is, uh, I have to admit, isn't the prettiest looking thing, but there are things that you can uh, make it look a little nicer. The, the gray previous concrete, I don't know, is just not a very attractive look, but you can add tints to it to kind of dress it up. So outside of the capture, one of my favorite tools to use in a less expensive way is if we think about rerouting water. And so this is capturing that water, <coughs> redirecting it into a vegetative system, whether that's a rain garden or it's a bioswale filter strip. And that's all dependent on site issues, soils and things of that sort. So um, rerouting runoff can be done through a variety of different ways. This is just a regular asphalt pavement and you go, well, that's boring. That's not doing anything, but it's actually graded to go into a couple rain gardens here. Um, also, you've got trench drains and there's a variety of trench drains that are available and it just depends on uh, a few factors. Depends on what you've got going on for slopes, how much is available in your budget, what you're looking at for, for maintenance of the system as well as what type of vehicles you might be driving over that, that trench drain. And when we first started, this is a project uh, back in 2005. It was one of our first ones with a plastic trench drain. It was for a DNR hydrologist. And it's funny, but we've done several of these driveways with a trench drain into a rain garden for DNR hydrologists. The nice thing that you're not getting with permeable pavements that you get with rerouting into a native planted area is you get habitat. So, you know, people think that permeable pavements are sexy, and I guess they kind of are, but I get a lot more stoked about diverting it into something that's creating habitat. So that's a plastic. This is a steel drain, and this is a, an ungalvanized steel drain, so it's allowed to rust. So that's what you're seeing there versus one that is galvanized. And so that'll stay that bright steel finish color forever and ever evidently. And so this one is being rerouted. This is a tiered rain garden. So it comes into the upper. So we had a lot of slope here. And instead of doing one massive deep, deep rain garden, we're just slowing it down into an upper area of capture into a middle and then a lower. And incorporating decorative accents is just kind of nice. It's just like a regular garden. And I think sometimes People feel that rain gardens are just messy and unkept and that's just not really what they can be. So as long as you attend to the function of it first, it can be the design of it, the aesthetics of it, the decorative attributes of it can look however you want, just like any other garden on your property. 
This is another example of a trench drain. So this is on a commercial. Um, this is down at Holy Trinity, which kindly enough, the Mississippi Water Management Organization helped fund this project to make this one happen. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. But this commercial trench drain, it, the entire project is, is kind of uh, it, similar to what's going on here on the premises at, at MWMO, kind of this self-discovery. You know, as you're walking around, you're going, wait a minute, this is different, what's going on here? So the water is going through this concrete um, cascade system and then underneath this open grate that I think is absolutely beautiful. And to the right there is another example of permeable pavers. So instead of trench drains, other ways to reroute water, with this particular driveway it was tricky because we had to counter the grades. So if you can see in the example, the, the drainage of the street is actually going down in the photo. And there was no available green space on the other side of the driveway to put a rain garden over there. So we had to kind of counteract the grades. And so I can do this using like permeable pavers. So on the one side, it's pretty shallow, and on the other side, which you can't see, it's pretty deep. It's about 18 inches deep. So we had to counteract to get the water to go into the rain garden the other way. So there's quite a bit of excavation, but it all works. So instead of doing trench drains, I kind of talked about um, grading or contouring that surface. So this is an example, we call it swaling the surface. So whether it's asphalt or whether it's concrete, when you've got a driveway that doesn't have a steep slope, then these are some of the tools that, that can be done so that it's not as expensive. So this one goes into a rain garden. The trick with, with uh, Minnesota, however, is winter time. So now if you think about, okay, that driveway is being plowed, it's being cleared, but now everything is going and it's graded into this rain garden. So if that rain garden isn't being plowed or shoveled, right, then what happens to that surface? So these are some of the tricks you, you know, it's easy to think about for us, you know, what's going on when there isn't snow, but there is considerations that you have to think about with snow buildup and winter maintenance. And again, this is another driveway that's sloped into a, a, a three-tiered rain garden. And this is the same project. So this is the one, the one year before uh, the homeowner had decided to do the planting. And you see kind of those, uh, I call them hair plugs. When you first see no mow, it kind of looks like men's hair plugs to me. And it, uh, you kind of have to keep up with it a little bit. But look at this. I mean, here it is in two years. So in the foreground is that same no mow. And no mow is really low mow. So you mow it or weed whip the stalks that shoot out in the spring and the fall. And that's got that seed that disperses to kind of thicken it up. And we like to term this grass more of a shaggy lawn so that people understand that, you know, a no mow or a low mow fescue doesn't look like a typical lawn. It's gonna be a little longer, but I think it's absolutely beautiful. We've had so many of our clients now just, uh, it's almost as, as if they're more thrilled about the no mold than they are with anything else because the wind will come and it'll create kind of these patterns in the grass that just look astounding. Um, another project, this uh, apartment complex, they, uh, she, the, the apartment complex is about two blocks away from Lake Nokomis. And the parking lot, it's five or six car parking, it's not very large, was gravel. And she said, isn't this great? I'm able to just keep this gravel because the water goes right through the parking lot. And I had to explain to her, unfortunately not. We kind of think that pavers that we see out there and uh, any type of a class five base material is permeable, but it isn't. So what is underneath or within that system, it's compacted. So again, you have a three quarter inch rock and everything below that. So three quarter inch minus means all the fines. And when you compact it, and you know, that compaction just happens normally, but also when you put it in, you wanna compact it. So it's usable. It won't allow water to go into it. So the other bummer about class five is that you've got sediment coming off of that system. So what I had explained to her is, um, how the existing parking lot was, it was sloped into the alley. And I said, every time it rains, it's moving some of that sediment. And what, I mean, sediment is one of the problems, but what's attached to the sediment is a bigger problem for us. So 
I said, you know, I know you're not really excited about asphalt. You know, it's a petroleum laden product, but at least what we can do is we can minimize or get rid of the sediment, obviously, but we can soap it in a way so that it's being treated. So that's what we did here. We, we redirected the parking lot to go into a rain garden. So the last category that I really wanted to talk about in terms of you know thinking about your driveway is, is eliminating pavement and that's the most exciting i know i said the last one was exciting but i think this is my most exciting part <laughs> so it goes back to my motto of you know eliminate the all the paving that my father has done um, and all of us over the years and Something as simple as concrete runners, I think it's funny because, of course, we've seen some of these, you know, in areas of St. Paul and areas of Minneapolis, you know, that were done in the 1950s and the 1960s, and, you know, it was, it was just a smart, easy way of doing things, and it can be done so that it, it looks great, but it's getting rid of pavement, most importantly. You know, we don't need an entire driveway, generally, to be paved as we're doing it. This um, is just showing the, the crew putting the forms together for the runners, so you can kind of see how that works out. And the homeowner decided just to have it mulched, and then she was going to put some ground cover in. So what you don't see is the compost underneath, was, which was extremely messy with the concrete runners, and, uh, and then the mulch. And up on top, um, the other thing uh, that I did want to address is Sometimes driveways can be used as a multi-purpose, and especially in urban areas where you're limited with space. They have a long, narrow lot on this property in her backyard. She gardens and she likes to do a lot of food production with her gardens. So they didn't have really anywhere to kind of sit or create a patio. So we designed the driveway to act as, uh, as an outdoor patio as well as a driveway. So that's the other, you know, can, can the driveway be a multi-use type of a surface? And certainly, you know, this is, uh, when you're dealing with permeable systems or you're trying to capture, you want to work from the backside out. So, and with track equipment as much as possible. Track equipment just helps eliminate compaction of soils and whatnot. That's Randy. And he always has his cooler right alongside of him. <laughs> the man eats like 12 times a day. And uh, again, the guys here, here they uh, are putting the concrete in and finishing the concrete. And this particular driveway uh, was pretty interesting because they called it Lake Harriet II. So they, again, live pretty close to the lake and their entire property, they, I think it was somewhere about 75 or 80 percent of the property is impervious. And uh, a portion of the front yard went to the street, but really everything else went down this driveway into the back and there was a dry well. And luckily they had good soils there. But what would happen is any kind of a rain event here, it starts off kind of slow and then you get this massive volume and then it starts to taper off. Well, what would happen with that massive volume is so much was coming down into the bottom here of that, I'm pointing at my computer like you guys can see, so much of it was coming right down to those pavers to that drywall which we kept intact and then it would pond up and it would pond up to like two feet up by their garage area and um, what we ended up doing is just increasing the amount of permeable pavement so that they had additional storage so that that could take the water in quickly until the subsoils could take it in. And it was, occasionally I encourage our clients to have things engineered. And this was one of those projects that I said, you know, this would be a good project if you're investing this much money to engineer it so that you can make sure that it's gonna work properly. They decided not to do that. So they went along with my design and luckily it's, it's worked out pretty well. Whenever I travel, I can't help but get inspired by different things. And I think that's one of the coolest things. You know, we get kind of accustomed to what's going on here. And just whenever you're traveling, like just looking at things. And for me, it's driveways. So my parents were kind enough over uh, the past winter while we had a bit of a break from our normal construction season. We went to beautiful Kauai. And the last day as we we're flying out, we were on this, we we're trying to find some parking to go to the beach for another three hours before we had to take off. We we're parking and this nice lady came running out and she goes, you're gonna get towed. <laughs> Don't park there. Well, we got chatting and I said, I really like your driveway. 
And sure enough, just the week before, she had put this driveway in. And it's, it's a system I hadn't seen before. So it's the turf stone pavers, but they did it as runners. And then she was going to be doing the seating and everything. And I just, I thought, well, how cool. So we get chatting. Well, it turns out she's from Minnetonka. So she's been living in Hawaii for the past 25 years. And uh, what a life. She's been having a good time. And then these were some of the other driveways. I, you know, I, once you figure out what needs to happen, you can kind of get into the aesthetics a little bit of it. I just thought those were kind of fun. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is the whole carbon footprint. So again, when we talk permeable pavements, we get really excited. We think it's super cool and it's so much fun to watch, but it doesn't mean that that makes the most sense. With permeable pavements, there's so much excavation that goes into that process. So if so many people say, hey, I want to do an entire permeable driveway, and we get into how much materials are coming out, the materials coming in, where are the materials coming from. I prefer to use granite in our permeable pavements um, for a lot of reasons. I'm not an engineer, but this is just my prerogative. But that granite comes from St. Cloud. So then you think about that. So that's coming all the way from St. Cloud to come to my driveway in Minneapolis, you know, at a two foot depth. So say I've got 20 tons of this, I've got 30 tons coming out. Now I've got these pavers going in and you're spending a lot of money. So in my mind, instead of just looking at it that way, I encourage people to think about, well, what is it that you're trying to do? So if we're thinking about lessening the impact on the environment, let's think about the carbon footprint and I think what helps most importantly is thinking about the stormwater. So if we say, let's look at a two inch rain event, look at, let's minimally look at a 1.2 inch rain event. And these are 90% of the rain events that occur here. So if we could capture or reroute that into a rain garden, then what's coming out from the property after that is cleaner. And so in my mind, that's, that's my personal approach. Uh, the other part is reuse. You know, sometimes you've got an intact asphalt driveway that's not too broken up that could be reused. So does it mean the entire surface has to come out? Maybe not. Maybe some of it could be overlaid and then some of it removed and a trench drain to go in or swaled or something like that. And the last point is recycle. And uh, you think, well, what could be recycled in a driveway? But if all the materials usually in a driveway can be reused. We bring those to a place that then crushes that material. And asphalt, based on the tonnage, is the most highly recycled product in the world. So I get to be excited about that. Um, so anyway, that, that goes to a crusher, they crush it up, and then that gets used as base material for our roads and our driveways. And lastly, the driveway is one area, but I did just kind of want to briefly talk about it's still important to look at the overall property. And the first thing to do is to look at the house, look at the rooftops, look at the downspouts. These again provide opportunities to capture water in those areas or filter it. And um, two projects that I just wanted to mention. So this one in particular, you know, we think about our own property, but sometimes we need to also think about surrounding the property and what's going on. This particular uh, homeowner had three properties sheet flowing into their backyard and flooding their basement. So what we ended up putting in was, I don't know if you think this is a small rain garden or a big rain garden, and fortunately they have clay soils. They're about a block away from Moore Lake and Fridley. And we had 15 loads of soil come out of this with about 10 or 12 loads coming back in. And I love it because they, do you see the little sculptures there? So there's the little frog and then there's the cat with the kitten in its mouth and the other kittens and they've got lights and they're all excited about this cute little garden. And in two years, it looks like this. So all those little accoutrements are gone, but I think it's absolutely stunning. And this picture was taken in the heat of the summer. There was a drought and you can see the Kentucky bluegrass. That's not doing so well, but look at those native plants thriving. This is another property, again, instead of, we did do the driveway, um, but what was even more important was what was going in the backyard. They had a sump pump running, it seemed like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they were constantly replacing the pump. So what could be done differently? Again, we put a rain garden in the back, 
and then connected it up with the front one. Now you can see these rain gardens are pretty large and uh, so I'm just going to get on my pedestal for, for just a minute, but I want people to think about, you know, there's, there's a right way of doing things, right? So it's not just about checking something off the list and making yourself feel good. I think if you're going to do a, any kind of stormwater capture, it's really about designing it for a specific ring event. Are we going after 1.2 or are we going after a 2 inch? Let me look at the entire site and what I need to do to do that. And I always had the analogy, it's like taking a two liter bottle of pop and you got the cap, right? So if that two liter bottle of pop represents a two inch rain event, and that cap is your rain garden, right? You turn that over and you pour that two liter bottle of pop. You know, is that enough? Is that enough for you to feel good? And for me, it isn't. You know, for me, I want to capture that, that whole thing. So designing things appropriately is really what's going to impact the watershed positively. And so that's what it's about for me. It's not about 10,000 rain gardens. It, it's about, I don't know, doing a thousand right or something to me. And this, um, just as an example, when you've got heavy clay soils, there's over excavation that's required. So this is a property that uh, we didn't have, we just had to do a lot of capture in this one area. So this ended up being the rain garden. It's another tiered rain garden. And this is the first year with the plugs, and then this is in two years, which I just think is beautiful. So when we get into capture, whether it's with uh, permeable pavements, it's with rain gardens, it's really understanding what you've got for soils, it's understanding how you're using the surface, what's going to be parked on that surface. When I find out people have an RV or they've got this arc of a boat they're going to park on it, that already dictates to me what type of surface it needs to be. And then certainly, again, with capture and infiltration, we look at what all is coming into the area and then what are the soils in terms of how quickly can they infiltrate. So that helps us size things properly. And lastly, I just wanted to kind of talk about, so I've thrown a lot of ideas, but really it comes back to, and it can seem overwhelming, like there's a lot of options, but if you start asking certain questions, it helps to figure out exactly what you should do. And so when it comes to the design considerations as to what makes the most sense for you as the homeowner, the property owner, is again, how is the space being used? When I find out that, you know, the person likes to work on their car out in the driveway. Well, I know immediately I can't do asphalt there, so that's not going to work because they, you know, grab the hoist and they hoist the car up and uh, it doesn't work with asphalt. Um, are there any usable materials on site? Is there something that can, that can be reused? With asphalt in particular, and that's, you know, one of the other things that I love about asphalt. You can. You know, say you do an asphalt driveway in 15, 20 years, you can do an overlay. You know, that, that isn't something that is easily done with concrete or some of the other surfaces. Um, we talked about vehicle types, the big stuff versus the light stuff, and then just knowing, okay, how do I want to use this space? Do I want to combine it with an outdoor patio or, you know, do I need to have available parking because I don't have on-street parking and I've got my grandmother coming into town, you know, once a month or something. It's just kind of thinking everything through so that that driveway, most importantly, is functional for you. And then we talk about the aesthetics. And secondly, it's about site considerations. So we, first of all, we kind of figure out what all, how do we want it to work? And then we have to look at, okay, well, what are our limitations here? If we want to capture, what are our soils like? What are the grades and the surrounding grades like? Uh, what type of overflow do we have? Sometimes people haven't been able to put in driveways because uh, it, it, it goes into their backyard and their backyard is only a 20 by 30 area and so then we're able to pave it and put in a rain garden and suddenly they're like, oh thank goodness we have a driveway again. Um, equipment access is another consideration. It's um, just one of those things that we have to just kind of look at and say, well, can we get back here with equipment and is it going to make sense with what we're trying to do? And I think the other thing which is kind of cool, we've had a lot of with our projects and I think, um, you know, if you're working with a contractor, it's, you know, is there any part of this that I as a homeowner can participate in to make things uh, budget-wise work better for me? And then I always like to end with my hero. So we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them.
and then you have to stick your tongue out. So <laughs> that's how that ends. And then I would just ask um, if you gained anything from this conversation is to, to share what you know with your neighbors, with your friends, with your family. So thank you. city now that generally have small equipment. Uh, we do as well. Uh, with our landscape we have this ASV, it's three feet wide. I mean it's the smallest little thing and the guy that primarily runs it is uh, smaller than me so you go oh well thank goodness we got we got the right person in that unit. But then all of a sudden Scott who's six foot six and uh, close to 300 pounds all of a sudden he gets out of that thing so it's pretty incredible. That particular unit only has uh, four pounds per square inch. And because it's on the tracks and it's such a small piece of equipment, uh, it really does very little damage on lawns. So it's, it, I mean, a person is about, what is it, somewhere around 23, 25 PSI. So you think about that. We're doing more damage to the lawn walking on it than that particular piece of equipment. But you're right, when you get into those urban areas, especially like alley driveways and, and things of that sort, Using smaller equipment is just more effective for the crew doing the installation and for the homeowner in terms of budget. And I, you're totally right on with, yeah, can things be reused or retrofitted so that it's also less, less uh, intense of, of a procedure that's taking place. It depends on the size of the driveway. Smaller driveways will be more expensive per square foot because of the mobilization costs going into it. But on average, you would see asphalt to be somewhere around you know, four, three to five dollars a square foot. Concrete's gonna be about double. Pavers will be uh, uh, three to four times as much. Then you get into the permeable, right? So with the porous asphalt, you're looking usually, and. You know, when you're doing a commercial lot, it's going to be less, but say 12 to $15 a square foot. Same with concrete. And then permeable paver is usually a little bit more than that, anywhere from 15 to 20 per square foot. And now some of the pavers that are just absolutely beautiful are even more expensive, so then that gets into the mid-20s. So yeah, I mean, these, these systems get really expensive really fast, and so much of it isn't just the actual surface, but it's what's underneath. So it goes back to what's all being excavated and moved and it just takes time and it takes a lot of material. And then of course what you've got going back into it isn't like it's uh, six inches of class five in a typical driveway. Now you've got 18 or 24 inches of a coarse graded uniform granite aggregate system. So it gets costly fast. And, and I don't know an easy answer to it. City of Minneapolis, they've been better about that lately. Um, but yeah, there's another project that we have in Richfield and that's the same problem that we're facing because in their mind and everybody else that's driving around it, they go, hey, well, they just parked their car on grass. So then it takes education, right? Well, they didn't just park it on the lawn. They've got this, you know, really cool structure here that's holding the integrity of the surface. And, you know, we're looking for the fact that it's a, a greener driveway because it's permeable. It's because if it was just a regular lawn that you're driving over it, right, it's it, you've compacted it. It's no longer functioning as a permeable surface. In my mind, it, it takes somebody on the city level to, you know, be OK with that. And if I think part of it, if you can still make it look like a driveway in a certain way, I think that they're open to it and maybe that there's signage or something so it's clear to all the neighbors that, you know, I'm not just parking on my lawn here. This is, this is a different way of doing things. I think the concrete runners are, you know, kind of a nice balance to it. Um, and, you know, sometimes where we've got that uh, extra car parked is where we typically will do some of those, what you're thinking about, like the turf stone paper that has the grass in it. Right. Yeah, that ends up being the best, you know, it's good for like the boat parking or something. do a great
great job. So the papers themselves, can't remember, but it's something like 6,000 or 8,000 PSI. It's actually more durable than concrete itself. But it kind of goes back to the underlayment. So as long as the underlayment is designed appropriately for the weight load that's being on that surface, and that again comes back to soils, whether you've got clayey soils or sandier soils, and then the size of that material that's underneath it to support it properly. What, it's fine with the driveway to do those, um, those types of things. What you'll find if you start driving around town um, is with parking lots, the drive aisles or the roadways don't do well as permeable systems, um, outside of permeable pavers, but even that, that's kind of tricky because there's so much sediment. But you'll see more like the drive aisles be a regular conventional pavement and then the parking areas to be permeable. And that has to do with the volume and the weight load that's being applied. Porous asphalt, previous concrete, they have problems with rutting. So there's not enough, you know, we over compact things here because we don't want displacement. And the porous asphalt and, and concrete don't do well for uh, heavy vehicle weight load limits that are traversing that path quite a bit. You know, you have a semi, I think, what is it? Something like a semi equates to 12,000 cars. So you drive a semi down, you know, a parking lot, you know, that's, that's like 12,000 cars, like, my gosh. So it's, it's got to be durable. So you've got to design things properly. You know, and it's so cool that you mentioned that because I've always been against coal tar based sealers. And for me, it was the smell, like it just doesn't smell right. So when that's applied to the, to the surface and it's really hot out, that sun beats down on it, you can smell that, right? And even a year later, I mean, you can smell it. My neighbor did it and she's three doors down from us. And on a hot summer day, you know, it's like, I can smell it. And where is it going? I know it's going somewhere because Within two years, it's gone, right? So the coal tar base emulsion seal coats have the polyacetic hydrocarbons in it, and that's posed a big problem for us because that it doesn't go away, and so that becomes essentially considered hazardous material. So what they're finding is that these hydrocarbons are in our stormwater ponds. Unfortunately, they're going to our waterways too, obviously, but the stormwater ponds now are being dredged, and that soil needs to be handled properly. The alternative, the coal tar based sealers are asphalt based sealers. And so like the city of Minneapolis, uh, for instance, they went to all the, um, all the people that do maintenance such as snow coating and asked if we would say, hey, we promise never to use coal tar based sealers, which I think is awesome. So we're finding this in some of the cities getting proactive. White Bear Lake, I believe, is also kind of on board that they've um, said that it's, you know, I don't know the word illegal, but it's, not allowed to be used in the city of Wayfair Lake. So I think it's great. I love it. I'm not a big fan of seal coating to begin with. I think it's, uh, you know, it just makes your driveway look black. It's an aesthetic thing. And uh, my neighbor gets on my case because he wants to seal his driveway. He keeps asking me to do it and I keep putting him off. So, you know, if you do it, it, it just doesn't need to be done every year. Like I just say, you do it, use an asphalt based sealer, do it once every three to five years. That's, that's really all you need to do. It doesn't need to be done every day. I mean, every year, like you get your kids out and you know, that one day in the summer, we all go out with our stuff and see it. When you're doing a permeable pavement of any sort, you have to protect the surrounding area of that. If it's exposed soils that are sloped into it, that's going to be a problem. Certainly any kind of construction traffic where they're tracking material on the tires, that's going to be a problem. So it's really one of the last things that you want to do. Yeah. What would be nice though, if it is new construction, is to keep some of the surrounding areas, if, if that soil can be placed on site somewhere and regraded before the you know, whole lawn area or whatever is surrounding it, before it's finished. So that way you're not trucking that material off site somewhere else. So we have that with one of the properties that we're working on currently. You know, they built 
in addition to their homes, so they've got a lot of bare soil right now and a lot of weird grades, so we're able to do a lot of excavation and then just kind of grade out that soil on site. Good question. All right. Thanks for coming. I'll stick around for a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much.